they are a protected species. Um, you do have to purchase a license to hunt javelina, and there's a season and a bag limit. Uh, little bear fire, did that have, did that have a huge effect on wildlife? From what I've seen is it hasn't negatively impacted wildlife. It, in the long run, it'll probably greatly, um, it, it'll, I mean, it'll be beneficial to definitely deer and elk because of all the new growth that's going to come up if we can get some rain on it. Um, but all the new oak and all the new grass and forbs and stuff that grow in that burn area will, will be a huge benefit to ungulates and in turn, you know, the predators that prey on, on, on the deer and elk and whatnot. Um, initially, I think it pushed a lot of wildlife out, but for a very short amount of time, I think some areas that was burned almost like a moonscape went back, you know, a couple days after it burned, and there was several sets of fresh deer and elk tracks already on it. I mean, we're talking places still kind of smoldering. So, they pushed them out, they got out of the way, and then they kind of went back. And then when they saw there's nothing to eat, they probably left. But there's been a lot of growth on the burn since. I've talked to my yeah, I think a way to look at it too is, is a mosaic across the landscape. You're going to have habitat patches, a patchiness that are going to really thrive. And then you're going to have species that are going to start to key on some of those burn areas more than others. Uh, cavity nesters and birds goes right to burns all the time. Oftentimes, you'll have a big in, influx of rodents, uh, which brings a lot of other things in place. So, so I'll talk a little bit. So. Uh, just a thing about the fish in um, the lake up here, the, in the Benito Lake. How long will it take that to be? Well, Benito happy? Lake is under uh, under the city of Alabama. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder how long it's going to take that. Well, you know, it, they're doing some water samples on it now. I don't know where the city of El Alvaro is at currently, but I know there's some plans to, to, to dredge that lake you know, of the sediment that's locked up against the dam there. Um, but there's already uh, plenty of bird species that are coming through that we're used to seeing, like osprey and eagles, uh, even over wintering there. Um, makes me wonder what they're eating because there's not a lot of fish. I've seen people fishing there, um, even though it's a closed lake. Uh, you know, there's still... I guess the cyclic water coming through, you know, initially we had a big algal, algae bloom through that process because you have a lot of nutrients running into that. Um, and I would imagine, you know, over time, five, ten years, you know, that's probably a time frame we look at on the forest level um, before we step into some habitat restoration. So I'm not sure what the city of Alabama has planned on, on their end. I know they had a with the state to stock that for another 10 years when that fire happened. Right. So I don't know if you can talk to that about you know, how you offset that from grindstone. Or yeah, grindstone has been well stocked yeah. <laughs> since 2012. Um, and Bonito, we haven't, it hasn't been stocked since the Little Bear fire. But um, yeah, I think I read an article in the paper the other day where the city of Alberta received like over $6 million in like FEMA money or something to start pumping and dredging, I guess, the lake. I've heard a little bit of talk that maybe as soon as next year they might open the campground and that kind of thing. When it'll be open for as a place to go fishing, I really don't know. I, I don't know. It, it, like Todd said, it's really up to the city of Alamogordo. And of course, natural processes that are out of our hands. There's going to be a lot of flooding issues still potentially there, a lot more silt and runoff. So. I don't know. It could be several years before, you know, it's a place that people can go fish and enjoy. I'll get started. So I don't have any photos. Mine's all stat stats and numbers. And <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. So, well. I wanted to kind of tie in with the Habitat Stamp Program. The Habitat Stamp Program, back in, I believe, 2011, 2012, had $1.1 million sitting in at the end of the year. That $1.1 million is available for us to look at possible grant funding. Um, stipulation is that oftentimes we, we
we match funding we ask from the state. Uh, we take care of a lot of the administration, the uh, NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, which gets the public involved on the projects we're doing. Uh, everything from our partners, from Rocky Mountain Elk to Wild Turkey Federation, Bat Conservation International. We, as the Forest Service, don't always have the funding either to drive big projects. But when we tie into the Habitat STEM program, it can really make a big, a big effect on the landscape. And what I've been doing the last three years here is a little bit of what I'm going to talk about, I guess. And when I say habitat improvement, what do you guys think of? More. Could be anything, right? <laughs> so we'll go through a little bit of what, what I do. So this is a big one that Dan Ray in the back there was involved with. When I first came on the district, uh, he was actively working on a timber project that was in the Little Creek area. And it was a thin and burn of 950 acres. Originally, in 2011, uh, Dan went out with wildlife biologists like myself and Larry Cordova and asked his, his opinion on how we can do this, how the mosaic landscape can really look. And you kind of see on the hillside there, we, we pushed for some, some cover still. As wildlife biologists, you look for that. We, did, you know, we could have cleared the whole top off and left it as a big rocky meadow because it would you know, potentially be pretty exposed. But, you know, creating that mosaic in the landscape is pretty important because I think there's some value to that vision up there and, you know, people that live in that canyon. But also think about, you know, the wildland urban interface here is that, you know, is that a visible space for us. So the ability to, to move through that, fire through that, depending on the weather conditions, can be reduced severely, you know, through, that, through the process. A little closer look, you can kind of see some of that mosaic patterns. Uh, things were piled. And there, there's some randomness to it. It's almost kind of like a landscape artist sitting up on a high perch and taking a look down at how you want to go about it. Maybe Dan could explain how he went about it a little bit. <laughs> and then ultimately, coming back and putting fire on that. Very important. You know, we had a bunch of piles sitting there. You know, I, I would tell Dan, we'll save a few piles for some rodents and some other species. Uh, but really, that's fuel just sitting there still. So we need to get it out. And we have options. We have mastication processes where we can go in and just grind everything up. But there's some arguments to that. There's still a fuel on the ground. So putting fire back into that landscape can do a lot of things. It can promote grass growth between those clumps of, of trees, but also you know, put you know, the equation that's been missing for a long time back into that, that process. So, so wildlife habitat dollar, uh, dollars from the HSP program went to that one. Another one, uh, 2010, this is before I got here. This is the Maverick, uh, about 1,500 acres. Uh, sits out kind of out there on the 443 road. You guys are aware of where that is? As you go around from, kind of drops out around Reynoso Downs, it goes around to Glencoe. And you can see there in red, that's kind of like the area of affected acreage. That's not saying we cleared everything out, but once again, going in to create some mosaics. This was a different type of treatment. This was mastication. So you can see here we actually had uh, debris left on the ground, chipped up, and kind of spread out over, over the area. So you can see how thick some of the timber is there. Is that a before and after on the left? Before and after in the area. I, I couldn't find any photos of the exact points. I'm still looking. <laughs> Wait, uh, before here. And then an after here. So, habitat stamp dollars. I believe forty thousand. A lot of money. This is something more recently I've been working on. This is the Blue Lake Restoration project I worked on last year, and this was a, a new approach. We've had a, a historic wet meadow that was above here, above the town of Riadoso. And on Gavilan Ridge, we know there's been historic fire, Colcapelli, some of the other ones that have come through. But we had a landscape that was pretty limited in some habitat. But we also have a deer and elk population that likes to come right here quite often. And we were looking for ways to keep some water back up on this Gavilan Ridge. We had some historic water tanks that were put in with HSP funding. After that fire went through, the wind just ate them up. You know, there's no cover anymore. 
And so we decided to focus on this uh, Blue Lake area. I'll give you a little history of that. This was a 96 photo from Google Earth. Uh, what you can see here are the two pods that were created. These were human made. Uh, we, we're not sure if they just threw some dynamite out there and created some holes, or took a bulldozer and we pushed up the dirt on the sides, but we've got a set of trees on either side, and those tree class, age classes were much younger than the stand completely around the area. So we, we know over a period of time those tree ages you know, we look back to about the 30s or 40s when this was done. So a lot of history. Why is it called Blue Lake? I don't know. I'm still looking for a photo. <laughs> but historically, if you look at this as an aerial photo, we've got a huge depression here. And this depression, whether naturally formed through volcanic activity, a caldera where water has just settled in over time, or something to that effect. But what we had here was something that was unlike any other soil type. Here's a, a photo of the area prior to construction. We've got the two ponds that are kind of offset to the right. But I would notice the thinning we've been doing in there as well. We are in a wildland urban interface. So we're looking at some options to thin that area back in that ponderosa pine component. Uh, we actually used the Green Corps Veterans Corps out of Tucson, their uh, Southwest Conservation Corps group. And they were, we were tasked with training and uh, bringing some veterans groups up to speed on timber, chainsaws, fire, everything we could. So good, good workers. Really enjoyed working with them. What, where is uh, Blue Lake? I'll go back one map here. So, so off the, the Eagle Creek Road, you can see to, to the north there's a red barn where the turnoff is. That's Eagle Creek. And there's a small road to turn off on 128. It goes up to the ridge. There's actually a gate limiting access of, about up at the top here because of the fire that went through there and there's some closed road. But it, it's, it's fairly close to the public access. And it's right off that. Uh, so this is a uh, Gavilon Canyon Road, I believe. Yes. So what we had there, this was our pond as it set. Prior to construction, we had a lot of topsoil, and we had this huge clay layer, five feet of clay, sitting there. And we had a sand and gravel layer that was just interfaced with this pond and draining it. So water would sit there maybe a month. You know, it was ways, we were trying to think about ways to maximize that water retention rate over time. So we came in with a design to compact the clay upwards of the sides and take two feet of minimum compact, compacted clay on that edge, all the way down to the bottom. So, so that's the premise. Keep that shape in your mind. And then we started tearing it up. That's when I got scared. That's a lot of soil. <laughs> and we're moving a lot, we're affecting a lot of area. So basically what we were doing here was harvesting clay throughout that, that five foot layer. And we were recompacting it in those basins. And we would take six inch lifts of uncompacted clay material, mash that down to two inches until we came up to two feet. So. And what we ended up with was seven ponds in the area. So we, we took the two original ponds and spread them out a bit, gave more surface area, but we also created some areas where water would can infiltrate the soil but also move out of those wetlands one day so that whole meadow could be technically a blue lake. Um, we'll go around the, the processes. This was March 2012. So this was right at the start of our monsoons. From March 1st to September 30th last year, 18 inches of rainfall. That's all. Keep that in mind. Then we get into late July, early August. Notice how those ponds just kind of disappear. We want them to disappear. They're, they're out there and they hold water. One thing to remember is a wet meadow is still a wetland. Still holds wildlife and has water potential. And then September when the die-off starts to come in. Late September when the grasses are starting to recede back. If you go out there today, it kind of looks pretty dry. But 
what we have is kind of the secret underneath. We've got that two, two feet of compacted clay. And then I'm going to show you a little bit of water in these. So here's our retention rates. We were trying to get more than, more than I'd like to have six months out there, but we need that rainfall. So what we're doing is maximizing any rainfall or snowfall events. So there's things to think about. Uh, so this was uh, August, when some of the heavy rains were coming in. I call them heavy, they weren't that heavy. <laughs> you can see the, the whole area is pretty muddy. We have a lot of debris we put in there for structure, because there's a lot of species I'm going to show you that can pop up. Uh, one of the areas in Blue Lake 7 was the parking area. Well, I had tons of compaction there. People drive all the time on it. <laughs> So what I did is took half the parking lot and made a wetland there. And we did the same process there. We found two feet of compacted, or five feet of uncompacted down to two feet of compacted. That one held more water than any of them through the whole season. So. And I've got Sam here. He's in the back. He's one of my technicians that works with me. This was the important part. Over the meadow, and this is all natural grass. Very important. We pushed all the soil, topsoil, back into these wetlands when we were done. Because there's habitat there for other things. And mainly a seed bank that I couldn't beat with any seed mix out of Curtis and Curtis out of Roseville. <laughs> so. Some of the species, spade foot toads, something your mom or the mother could only love over there. <laughs> uh, fairy shrimp. Has ever seen these? On the left here is a Streptocephalus fairy shrimp. They're about that big. Some people call them sea monkeys. These are naturally occurring. They can persist for hundreds of years in the soil until rain comes. 41 day lifespan. This one was a long tailed fairy shrimp, or the triops, closely related to the horseshoe crab. Really old stuff. And you can see that kind of residual eye on the top. Looks like and with that, other species come. So I had classes out there on numerous uh, events, and they became a garter snake fest for a while. So I had to warn all the students. I said, you're going to probably see 10 snakes today, and they're all going to be garter snakes. They won't worry too much. <laughs> uh, so one of the classes that we brought out, this is Texas Tech. Uh, Carrie Griffiths Kyle here on the left is a professor of ecology, wetland ecology. She brought a class out to do some sampling. They took some samples back, and they're still trying to go through what they what they found, what the, what occurred. But more importantly, the educational component. This is her daughter, and when you get a little girl coming up to a little snake, you then you know something like this. <laughs> All right. Two weeks ago, I completed grindstone mesa wetland restoration. Same process, same soil type. Both of these wetlands had. This one had. Ten rocks I found in the whole process. Blue Lake had like six rocks in the whole process. There's no rocks in these meadows. It was pretty amazing. Historic uh, small pond. Uh, my benchmark said that the, uh, the maximum capacity of that was about a foot, point uh, five, on maximum water depth in the middle. So we came in with the same process. Here I was building my hockey ring. <laughs> It really looks a, a, a bit destructive. And what we did was the same process, not compacting that clay material. And we found almost 95% clay all the time. And that's where it's at right now. So two weeks, two weeks uh, for just this Monday, we went out and seeded this area just to limit some erosion. It doesn't look like it, but that capacity there is almost two and a half feet to three feet of water in the middle. We did push all that topsoil back. It does two things. It protects you know, the clay layer we, we recompacted, but it also brings that habitat and that structure and species back. So, so one day I expect some ducks to be there and they'll bring some seed. We'll have some wetland obligate species. Some of the future ones I'm working towards is the Lake Mountain Post and Pole Wetland Protection. This is another wet meadow, um, historically had a fence on it. It's a cattle allotment, so I'm looking at options to come in and have dual use where we protect some of it. And we also have areas where cattle can get water. Pretty important, gotta have that balance. 
This is up around uh, Tucson Mountain. Is that area? To the north. This was a big one, White Fire 2011. You guys might recognize the moonscape. Um, historic pinyon and juniper mixed with ponderosa pine. We had a 1940s water catchment. It was 100 by 120 feet wide. I think maybe the CCC maybe jumped on board on building some of that. It's hard to say. A uh, lot of wood structure underneath, blew it out completely. It had a 45 foot across deep foot deep tank that was collecting rainwater in the feed cow or a watering cow. So I, I got Dale Hall at the time with HSP. We talked about it, looked at some reconstruction effort. What I got there was HSP dollars to clean that up. Uh, we recycled all that metal and it was about $1,900 of recycled material on cost savings. And what we built in its place was something that was going to stay out of the wind. So we, have, we don't have the tree structure there anymore, so we created a pad, catchment pad, at 70 by 70 feet, with two pipes coming in, feeding three tanks, each tank at 5,000 gallons. Two of them for cattle, one for water. And I actually rotate back and forth on which water's open based on when they're running cattle and when they're not. I can save water either way. HSP done. And then water catchment tanks. Those are the big ones that have been on this forest since the 40s, probably. Um, part of the state's efforts, you know, initially just put water every mile to create that option for corridors, but it's also the limiting factor in a lot of things we do. So we actually can still build these, and this is the 3,500 gallon tank. Uh, we actually run it out to a gravity fed drinker. These are two of my technicians, Dakota and Skyler. And the thing about these uh, water tanks, we do enclose them because they are wildlife dollars and we have to keep that water dedicated to wildlife. Um, we try to look at options for dual use in, in, uh, in certain ways, but sometimes the, the, the areas just kind of lend themselves to be wildlife focused. Drought. <laughs> Five years of it, right? Or more. Uh, I found a way to, to work with our fire guys to say, hey, can you train some of our guys on pumps? Or go out and work with them on their skills to use the truck. And you know what? Can we go fill the tank? So I've actually enlisted a lot of our fire guys on occasion to go out and fill some of the tanks that are, are more regularly dry due to a lack of rainfall. Uh, and we can divert that water. It's collected rainwater off our roof here at the station. So my cost is really just the fuel and the time with the guys. So, but I get training bonuses and whatever else for them. So it keeps uh, keeps them busy when they're not on fire. So really appreciate their efforts. They do a really good job. And then we always like wildlife photos of, of these drinkers. Um, this drinker uh, was actually purchased by Bat Conservation International. Notice it's very long. Uh, BCI said a minimum of 12 feet would provide an opportunity for BAPS to come in and take water on the lake. <coughs> so we, we created a tank design or a drinker design and we're providing plenty of water for all sorts of species. What are those? <laughs> this is yeah, this is the Salazar tank. It's on the south road of the Capitans Mountains. Plenty of people walking by these two. Some thumbs up here. Oh, and her bears. You were asking about bears and pinyon juniper. Plenty of bears with this one. And this one likes to take a bath <laughs> at 29 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's important. You look at it, it's 2 a.m., bears moving through. Hey, you know what? There's water there. I'll take a little of that. You know, a lot of times, a lot of, a lot of wildlife just metabolize water through what they eat. But when it's available, they, they'll definitely drink it. So. And then they really take it sometimes. I think I count seven there. This is on the south set on the south end of the county. One of our long drinkers, too. You know, I, I kind of keyed a lot of these long drinkers around this rock formation because we do have a lot of bats. Is 
is um, access to the Blue Lake area, is it public or is it a public. restricted area? Absolutely. Yeah, um, and there's some signage up there too uh, in the meadow. Uh, Larry Cordova has done a lot of work there in the past to, uh, to identify that as an area for education, public, and given our recent low air fire, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for someone to go take out, take the dog out, take go for a hike. Um, it's open to everyone. Full access. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned your presentation talking about the burn Good question because the costs are very different. <laughs> Maybe Dan can answer that a little bit. He's with fuels. So. Yeah, I, actually, uh, this district, part of it was, well, actually, a lot of it was cost. Uh, for several years, we were getting a lot more funding for thinning treatments, and we were able to treat so many acres that every year that the fire guys couldn't keep up with prescribed burning all those acres every year. So we did a lot of mastication. So we just you know, grinding up the trees and getting it on the ground, and then, uh, and then that would be its finished state, and we wouldn't have to go back in and burn those acres. Uh, uh, now our budgets are a little bit less. We're doing less acres, and, and therefore the fire guys can keep up with prescribed fire. So we're moving toward more traditional thinning and, and burning of the of the residual uh, material. Um, so it's, it's a lot of it's, and, and we've gone back and forth. There's been a lot of studies as to the effects of mastication, the pros and cons. Uh, so there's a little bit of debate. There, there's, and you can see some, um, some benefit because it, it allows uh, water to get into the soil and then it kind of keeps it from evaporating right away. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you see a lot of grasses and forbs come up right away uh, with mastication. Mm -hmm. But then also the, the, in the pinion and juniper, well, especially the juniper, slash will stay there for quite a long time. Um, a lot of folks will, uh, in the east will masticate uh, and there's more uh, water in the soil and, and the pine will deteriorate a lot quicker mm -hmm. where the juniper slash here will kind of stay on the ground and we would rather it see it you know, uh, be consumed or get back into the soil. So burning is a little bit more of a benefit for doing that. So. There's some pros and cons to both, but right now we're, we're um, mostly using mastication in smaller areas, places where we don't want to burn. If it's uh, close to houses or an area that we don't want to uh, have too much smoke impact, uh -huh. um, but we're doing a lot more traditional thinning at this point. Thank you. With these wetlands and then with trying to do there is give the groundwater nowhere else to go. Okay. Uh, basically that design uh, gets down to that bedrock layer when water boots underground and hits that bedrock layer, it won't go through that. It hits that clay layer, it can't go any further. As okay. it comes. So, um, you know, both of those wetland sites have no active perennial stream moving through it. Um, and so we're, we're really maximizing that potential for rainfall there at the site. We're also trying to limit the amount of maintenance we have to do over time. These strip tanks that are out there, there's over 45 on the forest from just this district alone. And there's a maintenance cost associated with that on a yearly basis going out there. It could be fencing, it could be float systems, it could be someone shot a hole in the tank. Um, that historic legacy is there. And so with reduced costs coming up out and that, that approach, we're looking at other approaches. And we've actually gone into uh, Littleton Canyon around Benito Lake in the past, and we did a, a spring uh, restoration there where there was an active spring, and we actually opened that spring up, created an underground dam, and created a dam on the side of it so it would have a larger water presence there year round. So there are, there's some option for that. And that was sponsored by uh, Bat Conservation International. And then we have Little Bear Park, so I took it out. Well, Larry and I are uh, actively looking at those time frames now when we can go, go back there, because the water's still there. We just need to get the soil and, and the gravel and everything else out of the columns. So. But did the fire in any like, like when we see the salt cedars, when they've been taken out in the spring to come back, mm -hmm. has that been? I've seen, I've seen <laughs> both. I've seen water show up in a different place.
place, you know, oftentimes it's that gravel component coming down the hill that covers it up or limits that water from surfacing where it historically did in a lot of places. Um, there is an approach to, to going through that water, that water table and looking at uh, maximizing those options down slope further and further or going back up to source, you know, over time. It's, it's a little challenging with